synthesis of these hormones. Over here, both iodine and tyrosine are essential for the synthesis of thyroid hormones. Okay, so the question is, from where do we get this iodine and tyrosine? Like every other nutrient, these are also consumed through our diet. Well, this consumed iodine is in turn converted into iodide and is then absorbed from the GIT. Let's take a closer look at the thyroid gland. As we mentioned before, the thyroid gland is made up of several follicular cells connected by a colloidal cavity in the center. Okay, now over here, there is something called thyroglobulin. The cell organelle, precisely the endoplasmic reticulum, in the follicular cells produces these thyroglobulins, which are then packed into a precursor of thyroglobulin by the Golgi apparatus and are stored in our colloidal cavity. Okay, we will return to these thyroglobulin precursors and their storage in the colloidal cavity once we come to the synthesis part of the thyroid hormones. Now, consider the bloodstream. We already know that iodine is very essential for synthesizing thyroid hormone. So, over here, iodine in the form of iodide in the bloodstream is transported to these follicular cells along with sodium via the sodium iodide symport pump. Since it is a symport pump, both the molecules that is the sodium and the iodide are transported in the same direction. However, here we only need iodide. So once this iodide enters the follicular cells, sodium is moved back and out in exchange for potassium. Now, iodide is in the follicular cells. Here comes the point to keep in mind. This iodide in the follicular cells must be oxidized to iodine since only iodine is capable of combining with tyrosine in the thyroglobulin to form thyroid hormones. So obviously, the question is, what triggers this oxidation of iodide into iodine? Well, it's with the help of thyroid peroxidase in follicular cells. Okay, moving on, we have already mentioned that the precursor of thyroglobulin is stored in the colloidal cavity. So essentially, the synthesis of thyroid hormone should take place in the colloidal cavities, giving rise to the next concern about the transport of this iodine from the follicular cells to the colloidal cavity. Well, how is this accomplished? It is accomplished through the use of a transporter known as Fenrir. And followed by this, the transported iodine binds to the tyrosine ring in thyroglobulin. Basically, this iodination process is accelerated by an enzyme called iodinase, which is secreted by follicular cells, thereby converting the tyrosine molecule to MIT and then later into DIT. Here, if only one iodine binds to the thyroxine ring, it is referred to as monoiodotyrosine MIT. And in case, if two iodine binds to tyrosine, it is referred to as diiodotyrosine DIT. Sequentially, these MIT and DIT combine to form T3 and T4. Well, this T4 is also called as thyroxine. Okay, now the hormones are synthesized. Followed by the synthesis, these thyroid hormones remain in the form of vesicles within the thyroglobulin and are stored for a long period of several months. Well, this is a unique feature of the thyroid gland as it is the only endocrine gland that can store its hormones for a long period, about four months. Okay, now the question is, what happens when there is a need? During such occasions, this thyroglobulin itself is not released into the bloodstream. Instead, the hormones are first cleaved from thyroglobulin and are released into the blood via follicular cells. In the bloodstream, the T3 and T4 are transported to the target cell with the help of a special protein known as 
thyroid binding proteins. They include thyroxin binding globulin, thyroxin binding prealbumin and albumin. Well, the point to remember over here is that T4 is secreted more than T3 by follicular cells but T3 on the other hand is 10 times more active than T4. So as a result, once they reach the target tissue, T4 is converted into T3 which in turn increases the metabolic rate. Actually, this increase in metabolic rate has different effects on different target cells. 